Jackson County 911. Where's your emergency? I have an address. Hello, do you have an emergency? Oh, can I have a police officer at 5657 Madison? So it's 5657? Yes. Okay. And what's happening there? I just stabbed someone. You did? Yes. Who, who was it that you just stabbed? I don't know. I'm fed up with life. You what? I'm fed up with life. Okay, did you stab yourself? No. Well, I did take a whole bunch of kids, pills to kill myself. Okay, what's your name? Jamari and Longhorn. What is your first name? They have locked me up forever. Okay. For life. Okay, did you... Is it out. Take me to Jupiter. I don't want to be on this earth anymore. Kill me. Did you hurry up and come and get me? Yeah, we're on the way, but I just, I'm going to ask you some more questions. And you don't know who this person was that just came up by you? Nope. Okay. And do you still have the knife? No. Okay. What did you stab them with? A knife. Okay. Where is that? In the grass. Okay. So it's out in the grass? Mm hmm Hurry up. Hurry up. Why? What, what are you doing? So hurry up and come kill me or take me to jail, do something, and deck me how you do on movies. Give me an electric tray. I don't care how I die. Listen the way. Okay. All right. He didn't care who you were or what you look like. He just wanted to be your friend. Friends and family of nine-year-old Connor Verkirke gathered at Cornerstone United Methodist Church to remember his short life. It's been a very tough week. Sophie Big is Connor's grandmother. She calls him a diverse little boy. Connor pretty much loved everything. Um, loved people, life, singing, dancing, uh, Cub Scouts. Friends and family are still trying to understand why Connor was killed by another boy on August 4th. Perhaps one of the best examples of Connor's love, kindness, and generosity was in his final moments. When the child who took Connor's life asked if he could join them, true to form, Connor welcomed him wholeheartedly. Jamarian has since been charged with open murder, but the family says they're not blaming his parents. More anger with Jamarian, in a way. We feel bad for him, and we do hope that he gets whatever help that is available that he could get. Um, but anger too that he chose Connor. In closing, the family said they wanted people to remember the good times they had with Connor and learn something from his short life. He looked more like an eight-year-old as he walked into court wearing shackles, then sat next to his mom. At the Pinebrook Village Mobile Home Park yesterday, he asked three boys he didn't know, including nine-year-old Connor Verkirke, if they wanted to go play with him at the playground. There were three boys at that park. He picked a random one. So it could have been your son. Could have been the other, the other kid, too. Could have been anybody. Lawhorn, who turned 12 in March, was charged today in juvenile court for killing nine-year-old Michael Connor for Kirky, whose family called him Connor. Tiffany Armijo's nine-year-old son was one of the three boys approached by Lawhorn. He witnessed the attack on his best friend. So did a seven-year-old boy. Her son told her that Lawhorn walked up to them in the mobile home park and asked if they wanted to play. He, he came to like on our street and got the kids to go to the park. Her son told her they all then went to the playground together. The kids were talking to him, asking him like, where are you from, what you doing? Then her son told her he pulled a knife out of the sand and started stabbing Connor in the back. It was random, there was no reason, it wasn't provoked, they weren't fighting, there was no words exchanged, it was just malicious. Connor ran to his home and collapsed. Her son ran to his home across the street. Lock the door, lock the door. Everybody get in the house. He was scared to death. Lawhorn ran to a nearby house and called 911 himself. Said he had taken pills, stabbed somebody, and wanted to die. Police today were trying to confirm that the attack was random. So the, the big question now is just the, the, the why, right? I think so. I mean, um, I think everybody in the community wants to know why. You know, what, what brought us to this point? 
The suspect lives about a block west of the mobile home park. He has no record, no contact with juvenile court. Relatives, including his mom, were in court with him today, but left without comment. No, thank you. Connor's family said they were too shaken to talk, but his best friend's mom remembered a boy who often brightened up her home. He was over at my house every day. He always had a smile on his face. He was, he was a very happy kid, very energetic. She says she has not told her son that his best friend is gone. I mean, how do you explain this to your son? I have no idea how to explain it to my son. We are getting some troubling new details about the life of Kent County's youngest suspected killer. And the question, did Child Protective Services drop the ball? Target 8 is uncovering deplorable home conditions, including drugs and a history of child abuse. All conditions Jamarian Lawhorn was living with before he was accused of stabbing nine-year-old Connor Rekirke. What we're finding raises questions about whether the state should have moved sooner and if that would have stopped this heinous murder from happening. Target 8 investigator Ken Colker is here now with what he discovered. Ken. Yeah, Brian and Sue, these court documents show Jamarian Lawhorn's mom has a long history of child abuse cases involving broken bones, apparent cigarette burns. Since the murder, the state has taken steps to permanently take away her four children, including Jamarian. Anger is a justifiable emotion, but it's worse than anger. You can't be mad at that child, the 12-year-old. But he says after learning more about the boy's background from Target 8, he can be mad at Jamarian's mom and the state. What are you going to do to the state? I don't know what you do to him. You can sue him, I guess. I don't know if that, that won't change anything. Jamarian Lawhorn stabbed nine-year-old Connor Verkirke to death on a Kentwood playground for no reason other than that he wanted to die himself. He told police he had always been in trouble and had gotten teased in school, but those reports mentioned nothing about the abuse he had suffered at home or his mom's long history of abuse. Within days of the killing, the state removed Anita Lawhorn's remaining three children, ages two to 14. Jamarian is still locked up. Last week, it petitioned to take away her parental rights to all four. She should be held criminally accountable. In what way? Well, not only for what she did to her, to her son, but maybe for, for my grand, for what the, her, her son did to my grandson. Records show a long history of abuse. Anita Lawhorn voluntarily gave up two other kids in 1999 in New York after her one-year-old daughter was found with four broken bones and her three-year-old girl had apparent cigarette burns on her chest. In 2004, Michigan Child Protective Services investigated her for child abuse. Then last year, it substantiated allegations of child abuse against her and the stepdad. Jamarian was the victim. They went through parenting programs, but they were not charged with abuse. Then, after the playground stabbing, police found a home not fit for kids. Cocaine paraphernalia in the bathroom, no utilities, no blankets or sheets on the beds. They also found bruises on Jamarian. He said that his stepfather put them there. Records show both the mom and the stepdad recently tested positive for cocaine. Today, Connor's grandfather says it's clear that Jamarian needed help. Yeah, maybe even a hug would have done, you know? Maybe Connor could have gave him a hug. Yeah, I'm sure he would have given him a hug. If he'd known he needed one, he'd have given him one. He was that kind of kid. We try to reach the mom, but it appears her home is now vacant. Records show she was being evicted. Connor changed my life. I think that your first kid always does that. He changed everything. He made me a better person. He was always so naturally compassionate and loving, and it inspired you. Ten minutes later, everything I fell apart. Yeah. Connor ran home with his seven-year-old brother, Cameron. He grabbed him up under his arm, and basically they ran together. To their front porch, where Dad trained as a first responder for his job at an industrial plant. I immediately knew the situation was bad. As mom held Connor's hand, dad tried to stop the bleeding while kissing his son's forehead. He was saying that he loves us and he kept trying to roll over so he could look at me and Jared. The last thing I heard him say was when they were wheeling him into the ambulance, he said, mama. 
It was later that night they learned that the new friend, 12-year-old Jamarian Lawhorn, had stabbed Connor repeatedly in the back with a kitchen knife taken from his home down the street. Not until later did they learn why, that he wanted to die himself. Since then, their life has almost stopped. They're living at Jared's mom's condo. Neither has gone back to work. They couldn't bear to go to their son's vigil. It's like getting sucked into a whirlwind that you can't get out of, and you can't make it go away. It, everything keeps replaying over and over and over. Connor's mom often wraps herself in the blanket she made for her son. I sleep with it every night now. It helps, it just it helps, you know, like, make it feel like he's still close to me. But kind of they thing. keep getting out of bed for their three younger sons. Somehow, though, they found room for forgiveness. At Connor's memorial, Jared's mom spoke about opening the gates of the village and letting everybody in, helping everybody to work as a community, to be compassionate. And words are nice, but you have to take action too. They heard that Jamarian's mom, Anita Lawhorn, had been walking through their neighborhood, looking to apologize to them. So Connor's mom and grandma tracked her down. Soon they were standing outside Jamarian's home with a young killer's mom and stepdad. He was so shaken up, like he couldn't even look at us. His back was turned to us, he was bawling his eyes out. He kept hugging and saying how sorry he was and mumbling about Connor and just how awful. He was so broken up. Anita, she cried, you know, we hugged and uh, we talked for a bit. She said she was sorry. We told them that we forgave them. Then, Connor's mom did something that Jamarian's mom could not believe. Gave her a card with $150 inside. Told her to use it to buy groceries for her three other children. When she found out that there was money in the envelope, she she broke down crying. Saying, you know, she was saying she just didn't understand why we would help her after what her son did. You know, Brian and Sue, 13 year old Jamari and Lawhorn, the youngest ever convicted of murder in Kent County, wasn't in court for his mom's trial, but a recording of his voice was. You're not in trouble. I'm not here for anything to teach any trouble. Kentwood Detective Aaron Kitchka interviewed Jamari in March, more than six months after he had been charged with fatally stabbing nine year old Connor Burkirky. She started with small talk about his 13th birthday at juvenile detention. Then the interview turned to whoopings by his mom and stepdad. My brother and sister, we miss you, but we raise up by your school, and so He got it for being naughty, for acting out in school, setting his mom's bed on fire. He said his mom hit him with a belt, his stepdad sometimes with an extension cord, once for letting his sister climb a fence, punishments that he downplayed. Uh, we He recalled his stepdad punching him after catching him playing with a toy gun. But when the talk turned to the marks on his legs allegedly left there by his mom in May 2013, Jamarian refused to talk. Why not, folks? Because I don't think it's none of your business. Okay. I'm trying to help you out. Minutes later, the detective pushed again. The one thing I, I guess that I don't get is why you don't want to tell me about the marks on your leg and how they got there if it's just, it, like you said, a woman that's a spanking or feeling fucked. The detective says that Jamarian got up and left the room. Now, prosecutors say he was trying to protect his mom who...
I couldn't imagine how they feel losing their child. And I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to the court. I never imagined that I would be here, standing here like this. Um, I think over and over and over again, what, what could I have done different? Is all that happened my fault? And what kind of help that I could have gotten for my son? Jamarian Lawhorn, the youngest convicted murderer ever in Kent County, will spend a year in jail for abusing him. That sentence is much less than what prosecutors asked for. 24-hour news aide Danny Carlson was in court for that hearing. She joins us live tonight. Danny? Sue, prosecutors wanted Anita Lawhorn and Bernard Harold to get two years in prison each, the maximum for third-degree child abuse, which is what they were convicted of for abusing Jamarian. But the judge said today in court that he didn't think a maximum sentence would be the best for either of them because it would mean less time on parole and less supervision. Now, Judge Sullivan said today that to him, prison made no logical sense, but he also said that neither did the expectation of no jail time. He said that he will also have each serve 150 days of that one-year sentence. Now, Anita Lawhorn started serving that sentence right now. Bernard Harold will start after she is done because they are watching multiple children at this time, so Sullivan didn't want to have both of them in jail at the same time. Yeah, Brian and Marley, is there, they prepare for Christmas without their son, Connor's parents are at least grateful for this, that his death is leading to change. We're struggling with trying to do Christmas this year. And Today, he and Connor's mom learned from Target 8 that changes already are being made. Changes that could protect children from repeatedly abusive parents. We still suffered at the hands of this because somebody didn't do their job. The Office of Children's Ombudsman investigates complaints against CPS. It found CPS violated state law by not trying to permanently remove Jamarian Lawhorn from his mom a year ago, after it found that she and the boy's stepfather had abused him. The state was legally required to take steps to terminate her parental rights because of her history. She had lost two other kids years earlier in New York over abuse involving broken bones and cigarette burns. It was only after Jamarian stabbed Connor on a Kentwood playground on August 4th that CPS filed papers to terminate the mom's rights to four children, including Jamarian. The Ombudsman report is leading to a statewide change to make sure CPS follows the law. The Department of Human Services agreed to change its computer system to automatically notify CPS workers when a case requires a petition to end parental rights. I am really glad to see that some steps are being taken so this doesn't happen to another family or another child like Jamarian or my son. The Ombudsman report also focused on a second failure, that CPS didn't report the 2013 abuse allegations to Kentwood Police. That has led to training for Kent County CPS workers and their bosses to keep that from happening again. The CPS worker who handled the case has lost her caseload, but said she hasn't been disciplined. I think it's, again, the system uh, shuffling the ball around. I don't think they're holding anybody accountable where they should. Yes, yeah, so this trial is not over whether Jamarin actually killed nine-year-old Connor last August. There's no question about that, but what, what it's about is whether Jamarin was legally insane at the time. Now, today, prosecutors argued Jamarin was not insane, but cold and calculated that he had planned this for more than a year, that he wanted to kill somebody, get arrested, then be killed himself. They say his actions on August 4th, 2014 showed somebody who knew it was wrong, hiding the knife in the sand, even taking off his shirt so he didn't get blood on it. But the defense says Jamarin, who had been abused his entire life, was mentally ill and looking for a way out of a miserable life. They had no choice. This is his only way out. He even tried to kill himself. And that failed. He went looking for someone who he didn't know. And that someone ultimately ended up to be Connor Burkirk. Now, those are the opening statements of the defense attorney and the prosecutor. Already we've heard testimony, including from Connor's parents and from his little brother who witnessed the stabbing. Now we'll have much more on that tonight at 5 and 6. Beforehand. Started today with a pediatric doctor who interviewed Jamarian and examined him after the stabbing of Connor in August 2014. 
The doctor said she found evidence of repeated beatings and reports he'd been beaten by his stepdad, his mom, even his grandmother. We also heard about his issues with anger that he had started fires in his home, had gotten in trouble for taking a fake knife to school, and was torturing small animals. Now the doctor testified about the marks she found on his legs. And he stated, my stepdad beat me with an extension cord. He stated that it was to the back of his legs and that this had been occurring since 2011. Jamarian told me that he would get hit if he didn't clean up, do the dishes, or if he didn't fill the ice tray. He stated he made the statement that he treat me like a slave. Now the prosecution rested its case this morning saying Jamarian was cold and calculated but not insane. Now it appears this afternoon that Jamarian's stepdad already convicted of abusing him will take the stand and we'll have much more. Closing arguments are now wrapped up in the trial of West Michigan's youngest accused killer. The latest on this uh, day of closing arguments, Cap. Yeah, Brian, today we got conflicting testimony before those closing arguments about whether Jamarian was legally insane or just cold and calculated. Though both sides agree, he was mentally ill. Well, what is your opinion in this matter with respect to uh, whether uh, Mr. Lamarne was met the definition of legal insanity at the time of this um, my opinion is that uh, Mr. Lohan does meet uh, the statutory requirement of an individual who was suffering from mental illness at the time of the crime. And it is further my opinion that he did not appreciate the wrongfulness of his actions. He didn't have the capacity to do that. That was the defense expert who said Jamarian told her about a lifetime of abuse, even on the day of the stabbing. He was telling me that he, he was suicidal and he just want, did what he did so he could get the electric chair and um, or get a lethal injection uh, from the cops. But the expert for prosecution said even though Jamarian was mentally ill, he was still legally sane. In my opinion, he did have the capacity to understand the nature and object of, or nature and quality of his behavior. And she says he knew right from wrong. If he didn't understand it was wrong, he would not have then call and called 911. Now tonight at 6, closing arguments paint two pictures of Jamarian. Either he was mentally ill or he was a 12-year-old cold-blooded killer. Live in Grand Rapids, Ken Colker, 24-Hour News 8. A child on trial now convicted. He becomes West Michigan's youngest killer. We the jury find the defendant, Jamarian Longhorn, guilty in the first degree. Guilty. That chilling verdict coming down late this afternoon for Jamarian Lawhorn, now the youngest killer ever convicted in Kent County. There is a difference between a 12-year-old and an adult making a horrible decision like this. The case is a tragedy all the way around for any of us who have been involved in it. A 12-year-old child brutally murdered at random, a 9-year-old defenseless child, leaving behind a family that aches over the loss of a child deprived of the ability to grow up, to fall in love, and to make life choices for himself. And the 12-year-old killer who did not choose to be raised in an abusive and neglectful home is now faced with coming to terms with the pain he has inflicted, losing his freedom, and losing the ability to lead a normal childhood and adolescence. It is the court's decision to impose a blended sentence in this case. That is a disposition that delays the imposition of a prison of sentence under MCL 7128.181 m The court places Jamarian on probation under MCL 7128.18 sub 1 sub b with appropriate conditions. Those conditions include being committed to the Muskegon River Youth Home under MCL 7128.181 sub D. 
the court reserves and delays the imposition of a prison sentence unless and until a request is made to impose a sentence of imprisonment. As I understand, uh, the positions of the parties, uh, both parties agree that it is appropriate to simply wait to determine an appropriate sentence if and when the court is asked to impose such a uh, sentence. Uh, I do want to uh, remind uh, everyone, and I'll of course remind Jamari in review hearings, that violations of probation under the law can uh, result uh, in the revocation uh, of the probation and the imposition of the adult uh, prison sentence. It is critical that Jamari make his best efforts at the Michigan River Youth Home to take advantage of the services, to abide by the rules, and to prove to all of us and to himself that he is capable of turning his life around. I believe in redemption. I'm not willing to give that up on a 13-year-old boy. As he approaches his 19th birthday, Lawhorn says he is ready to leave an Osceola County youth home and get on with his life. 13 On Your Side's John Hogan has a look at what's next in that process. More than six years later, is he ready for freedom? Lawhorn's attorney says yes. He walks free on his own with the, all the support systems that have been put in place already. Charles Clapp is the attorney representing 18-year-old Jamarian Lawhorn. A review hearing took place Tuesday before Kent County Circuit Court Judge Paul Denenfeld. Uh, I continue to be uh, impressed and so pleased about how well you've done and are doing. It has been a long road to be sure. He was in a very troubled young man going through all sorts of problems. I don't think he could understand it or fathom it. Lawhorn was found guilty of first degree murder. He was sent to the Muskegon River Youth Home in Everett, now called Everett Youth Academy. During Tuesday's hearing, Lawhorn says he is ready to leave the facility and start a new life. I feel like I'm ready for something new. That is a possibility come March when Lawhorn turns 19. One possibility has him living with Paula Cresswell, who became an advocate for Jamarian Lawhorn and attended Tuesday's virtual hearing. And the Cresswell situation is something that you think can work? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I love her. will decide in March whether Lawhorn should be released without any strings attached or if he should remain under court supervision for two more years. It's a hard decision for me. I think uh, you can probably understand that. Clapp says he believes Lawhorn has proven he is ready for the next step. The young man I see today is eloquent, thoughtful, caring, truly remorseful. Uh, and accountable. As he approaches his 19th birthday, Jamarian Lawhorn says he's looking forward to returning to society and helping others. It's a blessing for real, for real. It's like, I'm, I don't know, I, I didn't think I could make it this far without that. After his court hearing today, he talked with News 8's Ken Colker about his childhood, about the death, and about the forgiveness he didn't think he deserved. I had no right to kill Connor. I killed him out of anger that I was feeling. And it's only for me, it's like, it's time for me to make it right to own up to my mistakes and just give back to the community for what I took. Since the death, he has been locked up and getting counseling at the Muskegon River Youth Home near Everett. He's in the 11th grade, is planning for college. It kind of sounds like a broken record at this point, uh, but that's a good broken record because uh, what I mean by that is that Jamari continues to do extremely well. Today, the judge gave him permission to take excursions with his victim's grandmother, who already visits him regularly and even wrote a book about the case. He wants to go to the YMCA and maybe movies and, and yeah, just wherever he wants some adventures. <laughs> the judge also approved excursions with a former juvenile detention worker and a woman who writes and visits Lawhorn often. Honestly, one thing I really struggle with is forgiveness because I just never understood how Miss Tony could forgive me for what I did. And it's like, I just, I just want to prove, I just want to prove to the world that I'm not who they thought I was that day. What's Jamarian going to be in 10 years? I mean, I, I want to help people that's in a situation like what I was in to honor them. Because there's a lot of people out there that need that help. A lot. Lawhorn will continue to live at the juvenile facility near Everett until he's about 19. That's if the judge can rule that he's been rehabilitated. Wow, that is a powerful story. I mean, so much forgiveness involved there and yeah. so many people coming to his aid after that. Yeah, and it started almost immediately. I mean, with, with Connor's family, with, with his parents, with his grandmother. I mean, it's, it's something that started right away. Yeah. It's remarkable. More than six years after Jamarion Lawhorn killed a nine-year-old boy in Kentwood, today a judge opened the door to Lawhorn's eventual freedom. His release from a juvenile facility in Osceola County was approved by Judge Paul Denenfeld. But the judge also said Lawhorn needs to remain under court supervision while he transitions to freedom. But I believe he's ready to go now. I would recommend he leave today. That from Dan Corey, juvenile probation officer for Jamarian Lawhorn.
Judge Paul Denenfeld agrees. He approved Lawhorn's placement into the home of William and Paula Cresswell, who are involved in a recovery program for offenders called 70 by 7. I think your life is going to change dramatically when you are placed in a new setting. I think this is best for Jamarian. Defense attorney Charles Clapp said Lawhorn understands the importance and value of remaining under the jurisdiction of the court, at least for a while. The next six months are critical for Jamarian to transition back into community after being locked up since he was essentially 12. How Lawhorn behaves during this next chapter will determine if he remains a court ward until his 21st birthday. But the court reserves the right to discontinue jurisdiction prior to age 21 if Jamarian successfully transitions to a less secure setting and appears to be thriving without the need for court supervision. Working in Jamarian Lawhorn's favor is what the judge called stellar behavior while in detention. Now this includes earning his GED and of course, contrition. From early on, Jamarian began to recognize not just the wrongfulness of his act, and he clearly recognizes the harm that he caused through his act. Lawhorn, who turns 19 in less than two weeks, thank those who have been involved in his case. I'm gonna say, I know what's expected of me. I know what I expect from myself.